So our next, for, so you've heard about our last 10 years. We've been thinking about the next 10 years. We have been working since May on a new model for technical leadership. We're suffering from our success, so uh, we need more people involved in helping guide us about where to head. And we've been thinking about what kinds of projects and collaborations we should have in the future. So George, to me, George Sabenko seems to be the perfect person to talk to us about what the future of cybersecurity might look like. Um, I was trying to think of words to describe George. I've known him for quite a while. Um, and I've decided that the three are affable, inspiring, and insightful. When, I, when I've been thinking about where my career should head or whether a problem I'm thinking about is a reasonable thing or it's sort of off the wall and doesn't make any difference, I have coffee with George or I send him a, a draft of a paper and I get his feedback. And he's always been really valuable to me in my career. Um, I was fortunate to be involved with him on a DARPA project. Um, he's the founding editor of IEEE Security and Privacy magazine. And he invited me and my husband, Chuck, uh, to be the book review editors when the magazine got started. So I've been very fortunate to have lots of interactions with George, and they've all been wonderful. He is the Dorothy and Walter Graham Professor of Engineering at the uh, Thayer School of Engineering at Dartmouth. And um, so we'd like to finish this celebration by asking George to come up and say a few words. Well, thank you very much, Sherry. That's a, a really nice introduction. The feeling is mutual. I've always enjoyed uh, the work that I've been able to do with you. Um, so my slides are up here. I just I wanted to um, point out, you know, Tony Tony started the day, and he had the NSA logo, and like we're really impressed. It's this eagle holding uh, uh, the uh, what arrows and stuff, lightning bolts, and. Uh, you know, this, uh, the Thayer School of Engineering was started in uh, 1867. And, but, you know, so it was like started by Sylvanus Thayer, who was the father of West Point, considered the father of West Point. But what really impresses me about the logo is how did they know in 1867 that uh, uh, a cell tower would be important? <laughs> you know, this is like really visionary. So, so it's not, bad, uh, not such a bad logo. Um, you know, I've been a professor for a long time, and the two, two things I've learned, among others, is um, one, uh, I've learned how to talk. I'm like a gas. I can fill any space, you know? <laughs> so, so if Sherry said, I've got five minutes, I could do finish in five minutes. If she said two hours, I could, I could do it in two hours. So the other important thing I've learned um, is never stand between the audience and the reception, OK? So I'm going to combine those two. And, my goal is to say 10 or 15 minutes of things and actually engage you in some of the uh, ideas that I'm going to present. So if you can go ahead one, one slide. You know, we're in Washington, and it's um, election season. <laughs> so, and, and it's the 10th anniversary of the I3P. So uh, when we're looking forward, it might be a useful thing uh, to say, you know, what, how do we measure progress? And uh, when you think about what uh, Tony said, so Tony painted a kind of dire picture, right? Uh, things are getting worse, and it's going to get worse, and so on. And uh, we've spent 10 years doing stuff, not just the I3P, but the, you know, the community overall has been working on this for 15 years, 20 years, depending on who you talk to. Um, so, so how are we, are we making progress? Is this a worthwhile investment uh, that the country's making? So if you go ahead to the next slide. <clears throat> Sometimes I wish I worked in, in a different area because when you, you know, when you measure progress in different disciplines, uh, it's easy to see that progress is being made. So if you take a look at this slide, uh, this, has, this is a slide showing uh, accidents, aircraft accidents per uh, million departures. And you know, over 50, 60 years, we've got the National Transportation Safety uh, Board. We've, you know, airlines have learned a lot about uh, how to build better airplanes. And things so you can see you know there's some bumps and so on but it's a steady uh, progress and and there's probably some asymptote some limit you're just not going to get around um, random accidents pilot error uh, uh, lightning strikes things like that so 
So this is an example where, you know, as a country, we say we've invested money in aircraft security, and, and the, sim the plots for um, uh, traffic safety are the same. So you look over 60 years, seat belts, uh, anti-lock brakes, things like that have made a difference. So it would be great if we could show a chart like this, okay? Uh, next, oh, I have the controls. Okay, I can do this. But actually, this is the kind of thing we see, and this is what Tony was getting at, right? That uh, the vulnerabilities, the attack surface is growing, and the damage is getting worse in terms of dollars spent. So, so you might say, wait a second, uh, this was fatalities per mile. Um, but this is absolute. It's not normalized. So, so I had a student, uh, Pat Sweeney is a <clears throat> an Air Force major doing a PhD with me. So Pat, uh, Pat and I thought about how would you normalize this? Is there, is there a way to take that number and sort of make it uh, equivalent to miles driven? And you know, one thing we tried was um, how much e-commerce. So you can get some numbers about how much money is being transacted. And so uh, how about vulnerabilities per a dollar of transaction? And you see a curve like this if you normalize it that way. So, so there's sort of a... a uh, a bad period, it goes up and down, but it's sort of coming down. So, so I'm sort of challenging, this is one of the challenges I want to sort of present to, to the community, I'll come back to it, is, you know, can we show that we're making progress in, in cybersecurity that somehow similar, takes into account what, what uh, Tony was saying, takes into account all the work that everyone's doing and saying we're making progress in some, some way. Um, if you take a look, uh, just as another example here, if you take a look at uh, uh, the trend in complaints, so again, this is not this is not normalized. This is the number of complaints uh, that this uh, government uh, organization is receiving. It's going up. But if you normalized it by again number of transactions or how much usage people are giving uh, to the internet, it would probably look much better. I haven't done that. So. You know, in, in the uh, process of putting these slides together, I actually have a project completely unrelated to cybersecurity, but it's with uh, DHS on border security. So we're, we're looking at adversarial models of the southwest border. And so I've, I've sort of started collecting these performance slides. So, so here's a plot of uh, apprehensions along the southwest border. So this is the number of people uh, that are apprehended by patrol at checkpoints at the border crossings. And, you know, there's sort of ups and downs, so, but recently it's going down. So you say, okay, this is actually a measure that uh, the Border Patrol uses. They're saying we're getting better because the apprehensions are going down. So to get at some of the unknowns unknowns, if you look at another data set that uh, says how many deaths, how many bodies are being found in the desert, uh, that's going up. So you put those two together and you say, well, we're catching fewer people, but it seems like more are trying to go elsewhere. Yeah. Um, just like in cybersecurity, we've been investing as a country more in border security, so we've been hiring up border patrol agents. As a result of that, uh, drug apprehensions are great. You know, the number of uh, kilos, I don't know what the units here, I, I don't remember the units, but. Um, uh, it's been going up, and it's proportional to the resources we're applying. But if you look at the wholesale price of drugs, uh, it's a different picture. So, uh, so once again, we're you know apprehending more. We have more people, but the price of drugs is coming down inside the U.S. So, so uh, what I'm trying to get at is um, uh, these sorts of performance metrics. What you measure can't be looked at in isolation. And uh, we're working in an interesting domain because it's adversarial. In fact, some of these ups and downs are undoubtedly due to the fact that we, uh, on the border, we get better at, at something, and then the adversary figures something else out. And you can probably explain that um, in the cybersecurity domain as well, where you know we start uh, getting good at uh, closing buffer overflow uh, exploits. Uh, and uh, the other guys start using uh, a different attack part of the attack surface. So I don't think this includes uh, social engineering uh, phishing type attacks, but maybe it does. It, it probably does because that uh, that would that would be the the mechanism that's used to exploit a machine. So 
Um, so a uh, point I want to make is that in the next 10 years, we have to, I think, not just I3P, but the whole community has to start uh, measuring and showing progress. Because, you know, we're, we're at a point where the budgets are going to get tighter, and I think the expectations are going to get higher on us. So it's that question, what have you done for me lately? And, you know, my father-in-law opens the paper and, and uh, sees, you know, Bank of America was hacked. And, you know, he says, you've been working on this 10 years. How come this is still happening, right? You probably get the same question. Um, so we have to have a, a better story for that. Uh, and I think we are making progress, but somehow we're not showing it. So we're, it's not just a question of showing the progress that we wrote this paper, we did this. We have to somehow show this aggregate thing. I'm embarrassed to put this up. I, you know, I have to have one equation. I'm embarrassed to put this up because Yaakov is an expert in risk analysis. So this is like baby stuff. But this is like, you know, the uh, uh, baby step in risk analysis is the, you know, the way you do risk analysis, you say, what's the probability of certain outcomes and what's the cost or loss associated with those outcomes? And you take the uh, expected value of that. And then you look at different investment options. So if you say, well, uh, if I invested so much in security, uh, what would it get me? If I invested a little more, what if I didn't invest anything? So these are the kinds of questions you'd like to be able to ask. So you want to pick the option that has the smallest expected cost. That would be the, the right thing to do. And, you know, the, the areas in which this has been successful is if, you know, poker, playing poker, uh, blackjack, things like that, games of chance where there's an analytic model that describes what the probabilities are precisely and what the costs and, and uh, winning, uh, winnings would be. So the other areas where it's been very successful is things like insurance, um, traditional insurance, portfolio optimization, operations management. These are all areas where there's a lot of data. So that you can have actuarial type data and find out you know, how many people are going to die at a certain age and therefore how should you uh, price the premiums. So uh, when we think ahead in terms of risk, it would be great to try to apply this to um, cybersecurity. And I, I have a partial list here of reasons it's been difficult. And those are things that I think we have to overcome. So uh, the first one is um, cybersecurity risk, it's adversarial. So uh, the environment is working against you. So unlike something like uh, uh, life insurance, let's say, uh, there, there's some stationary, non-conspiratorial environment uh, that's determining the outcomes there. So, um, so in a sense, we're really not looking to minimize costs. We're looking at a more uh, game theoretic equilibrium solution. So I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. The other thing is the network effect. So um, the, the extent to which a bank has to be good at cybersecurity may only uh, depend on how good the other banks are, right? So as long as it's like, you know, it doesn't matter how fast you run, uh, if a bear's chasing you, as long as you're faster than the other guy, you're okay. So, so we have this network effect for some let's say in the consumer domain and things like banks, because there are a lot of banks, uh, when you get into um, uh, national security secrets, there may only be one source for that. So um, uh, these are things that become part of the model, I think. Um, uh, I, I put down rare events in black swans. So, uh, you know, think about 9-11. Airport security was in an equilibrium. We were spending uh, the right amount of money on airport security, and then 9-11 happened, and it was one data point saying something really bad can happen, and it really changed our whole posture. So my feeling is in cybersecurity, notwithstanding all the things that Tony talked about and all the things we know about that are, are risky and potentially very dangerous, we are in an equilibrium. You know, Microsoft is investing what makes sense for them, the banks are investing what makes sense for them, the government is investing. Uh, what makes sense for them in this current operating mode. Uh, we don't know what the rare events are. So we haven't really seen these big 9-11 uh, type thing, you know, the digital Pearl Harbor thing. <clears throat> Another uh, difficulty or challenge is that there are different operating modes. So this, uh, Tony touched on that. What I mean by that is um, we're not in a state of war with capable peer adversaries. 
So we don't really know what that's going to look like in cyberspace. So uh, we're sort of guessing at what some of these operating modes are going to be, and, and they haven't been experienced yet. Uh, finally, uh, models of the adversaries and their capabilities. So trying to infer uh, what hacktivists can do, what peer competitors in, in cyber operations can do, um, uh, has to be done based on indirect evidence. And so uh, one thing that's uh, a factor here is, is that um, the capability is not so much in zero-day exploits, and I know Miles has shown that many of those exist and they're always going to exist or, or uh, that seems to be uh, in a, some sort of steady state. Uh, I'm talking about the capabilities in terms of people, right? Because uh, you can have a zero-day exploit and, and it goes away tomorrow because of a patch. Uh, so uh, it's really the capability of the people and the way they think. Those are the models that I'm, I, I'm thinking are important. So, so I see a 10-year uh, cybersecurity analytic goal that's uh, appropriate for us to think about is something like in, in 10 years, it would be great if we could say there's a certain cyber mission. That cyber mission could be online banking or it could be uh, operating an a air defense system is going to have some property, a queue, and what I mean by queue is things like availability or integrity in a certain operating environment. Maybe that operating environment is, is Florida, it might be Syria, it might be some other part of the world for some time with probability P. And this sort of comes back to that first chart I showed about uh, uh, airline safety. You know, most of us and many of us flew here. You know, that's in implicitly how we think when we get on the plane. I don't care if the plane's flying next year or if it's flying a week from now. My flight's two or three hours. I want to have very high confidence that this property holds for the airplane during some period of time with high probability. So, so I think that would be great if we could develop the science and the capability to answer questions like this or to be able to make statements like this. So that's uh, what I see as our challenge is um, uh, to be able in 10 years to answer the question of what have you done for me lately or are you better off now than you were 10 years ago in a more substantive way. And uh, I'd like to open it up and uh, hear what people think about that. Thank you. So, so, George, you, um, I like your statement at the end, and in fact, that's something we've done for a long time at Fault Tower Computing, but as you know, right. it's a lot more challenging in this environment. Um, what I wanted to ask specifically, and, and I think your answer is going to be yes, but, but, but I think it's an important thing to establish, is whether when you specify an environment Y or whatever environment it was, mm -hmm. um, whether the environment should be include a, a, a specification of uh, the attacker and of the kind of user. And, um, you know, uh, you're nodding, I think, yes, and I think many of us in this room would agree with you today. I would agree with you. Um, but if you look back at security and graybeards, they say you have to always assume the worst case about the attacker. So it's, it's a somewhat controversial statement if, if, you, if, you, if you answer yes, although I, I would answer yes. Yeah. Um, I think that depends on uh, what property you're trying to do and what mission you're trying to accomplish. So, so do you think it's possible with, without, for saying, universally quantifying over all attackers? Um, I, no, I, I think uh, we can build models of in, individual environments where you're dealing with a certain adversary and, and understand better, uh, uh, prepare yourself and do a prediction uh, on an adversary or an environment by environment situation. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. I yes, Jean. I have a very kind of small myth about your graph. Mm -hmm. It shows a really big peak in 2008 um, because you divide by economic activity. We did right. have that wee little bump in 2008. Right. So you might, you know, consider doing that as percent of GDP or something. And you, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that that probably the GDP. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I in see. In some smoothing, yeah. and yeah. then I would, as you know, 
I would yeah. feel great about that as a Yeah. We we had some explanation. Pat had some explanation for that, you know, went down and then went went back up because of some new release of Windows or something that happened okay. around that time. So I just can't yeah. help but wonder if that wee little economic event. No, that's a good point. I in fact Monday I heard that this year the total number of traffic fatalities is going to be significantly bigger than last year. And part of the explanation is people are driving more because the economy is getting better, and so there's some dynamic like that. Yeah. Well, since we're picking nits with the graph, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I like the general idea. Yeah. Since we're picking nits with the graph, uh, so not all exploits are not created equal, right? So what you really want to see is the graph of the numbers of loss. Right, but those are extremely difficult to get, and I have very little confidence in the numbers that were presented earlier, given sort of some retractions from various reports. That yeah, said. yeah, we People just sort of went, did a, a simple uh, uh, analysis of what we pulled out of, of uh, OSVD, VDB. Yeah. Uh, but to sort of, sort of on that question, uh, what can we do to get reliable data? Because yeah. without that, sort of performing these analyses, it's you know, they're, they're not pinned to anything real. Right. That makes it hard. Right. Right. So, uh, you know, this uh, goes back to, I think that's a good point, that uh, um, we're not getting good data or, it's, you know, a lot of it is uh, done with the budget that's available. And, and the kind of um, investigation that N NTSB does, you know, it's, it's more episodic than, than vulnerability analysis, uh, uh, is much more thorough. Absolutely. Yeah, another, um, uh, just to, while we're on this graph and, and criticizing it, uh, <coughs> you know, another, another way to do the normalization might be total lines of code that are on a typical device or something. And that, uh, the other day I just looked up uh, the number of um, apps available for the, uh, you know, the iPhone, and that's up to 600,000. So if you look at sort of how much code is out there and how that's growing and say, Okay, the vulnerabilities and the damage normalized by that might be an interesting uh, statistic as well. Just on this point, Denise, and I know others want to talk about this too. I think I, you know, love the theme because I think metrics are the issue that we need. And I just echo on the how do we get the data? What's the right measurement? You talked about um, insurance. You know, you have lots of data. Yeah. Well, in 1930, they did not have lots of data. Um, we didn't have data on economic, how to, how to evaluate the economy. We didn't have it on health statistics. As someone who analyzes health outcomes and risks in health, that's all because right. we get over years, we gather data, we tried things. If you normalize it this way, you get new data. You, you have to start doing this. Yeah. And coming to a group like this to say, here's what's wrong with your data, yeah. here's the data we really need, and then go get that data, and it's hard to get. But that's the way to think about it, rather than what sometimes security experts say, which is throw up your hands and say, well, we can't get the data, so we can't actually do the probabilities. Yeah. That's not good enough, yeah. I don't think. So I think it's Thank great you. That's to a very call for this. Perspective, yeah. Actually, Miles, uh, you've done a lot of work with the vulnerability databases, and uh, you might have some suggestions about how to improve things there. Um, Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> so the question of, of is this on? Okay, um, of to me, it always comes back to a question of sort of getting closer to ground truth. Even just with the data we have, everybody in this room, I believe, is a tremendous analyst, right? They're, they're great at, once they have the data, of, of evaluating it in various ways. Um, but I, I think there's a serious shortage of, of boy, I, I'll say it this way, of seriousness within the funding agencies of wanting to get closer to the ground truth. And researchers will just use whatever's available. Mm -hmm. And I would really like to see a push for increased funding for research projects that try and get a little closer to ground truths in various ways. So, okay, speaking as someone who's trying to address that problem, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, as, as long as we're on the topic of data, I mean, I agree with you that you know, and a lot of times we haven't been serious about getting toward ground truth, and you know, building on Sean's point earlier, 
we haven't even sort of taken a look at what data do we really need to solve the problems that we have. We're very opportunistic in data. I actually think that we're awash in data, but none of it's any good to answer the questions that you're talking about. So, <laughs> so the real the real sort of question in this in the, in the ten years of impact is that we've done a certain amount of collaboration with an I3P, and it's really helped to bring a lot of the technical you know, contributions that we've had out there. We've made a little bit of progress in data sharing, but shouldn't the next 10 years be a lot more about how to get good data and share it in this community in a way that would begin to answer this question? Yeah. So when you talk about data sharing, um, you know, one thought I had too that had to do with the networked effects and so on, that in some communities, let's say banks, they do know, they do share to some extent, you know, amongst themselves, to, to avoid the you know being the weak uh, the last one in the in the pack uh, trying to escape, so um, but we don't do that very widely. So we don't know sort of how's you know your agency's posture relative to some others or or some company and so on. So there's a lot more of that kind of sharing that could be done as well, not just vulnerabilities but uh, you know activity and and uh, actual exploits, successful attacks. Yeah. So have a little bit of news on that front. Um, those of you who are on the IEEE Security and Privacy Editorial Board know that we frequently have heated email discussions about questions, some of which are relevant and some are not. Uh, but there was one recently about the cost of cybercrime, right? And people were throwing numbers around from all sorts of different sources, some of which were credible and some weren't. So we have an editorial board meeting once a year. It's coming up at the end of this month. So I've invited Cyn Cynthia Schneider and somebody from the FBI, FBI to come and talk with us. Cynthia Schneider is the Deputy Inspector General of the Justice Department. And they just did a study on the cost of cybercrime. So they're going to talk to us about what those costs are according to their study. And usually the Inspector General's Office of Justice does a pretty good job. It's a mm. credible source. But we also want them to tell us how much is displaced from somewhere else, because maybe this isn't really a problem, right? Maybe the level of crime is the same, it's just that people are using cyber as the vector instead of something else. Yeah. But we're hoping to start a, a con well, we've already started the conversation with Cynthia. They usually fund their own studies internally at Justice in the Inspector General's office. But I think she's now perhaps interested in getting the I3P involved in looking, starting with cybercrime as the kernel, trying to look at where do we get credible data and how do we allow researchers to take a deeper look at it so we can have some sort of baseline for some of the claims we're making and yeah. and, and, and so, uh, get those graphs to be more In, in some of the credible. work that I've done, I, I was involved in that email exchange. Some of the work I've done with uh, DHS on, on border security, uh, I've heard a number repeated a few times that the global uh, criminal sort of activity amounts to something like $2.5, $2.6 trillion. So if you're talking about $100 billion, that's... Uh, at the noise level, because the the 2.6 trillion uh, includes human trafficking, um, drugs, uh, everything, and and so in the big picture, it may not be such a big problem. So that would be good to hear some more reliable data on that. Yeah. Uh, Chuck. I wanted to thank the, the speaker over here who mentioned the medical profession because I wanted to, to reflect on the question with which you opened your, your talk by posing a different question. And that is, are you healthier now than you were 100 years ago? Or I have to rephrase it slightly, is the average American healthier now than the average American was? Yeah, I was going to say, Chuck, I'm ago. not that old. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we're I, all I, I moving sure, yeah. up there, George, now. <laughs> No, is the average American healthier now than the average American was 100 years ago? And I think we would give a fairly strong yes answer to that. But part of the reason is we almost never hear of a case of polio these days, whereas right. polio 100 years ago was a major thing. The huge flu epidemic of 1918, 1919 that knocked out a huge proportion of our population then 
we all go, I got my flu shot uh, a week ago. Sherry got hers a couple of days ago. We all get flu shots. We yeah. very seldom have flu. So what we've been doing in the medical sense is nibbling away at major pieces of the problem. And that gives us a, a sense that yes, we are actually healthier. Yes, there is still cancer. Yes, right. there are still heart attacks. Yes, we have all of these other things that, that were perhaps lower down on the interest level that have risen up because we've displaced things. Now, I'll flip it back to security. We seldom hear of a website defacement anymore. We seldom hear of a diskette based virus anymore. Yeah. Okay. There and there are, no are several yeah. other things yeah. that we seldom hear of. <laughs> yeah. We seldom hear of a discount. Yeah. Uh, there are several other things in security that we seldom hear of anymore because we have addressed them. Now, your question, have we, uh, have we lost ground in the sense that the virus attack is now being supplanted by a SQL injection attack, which is now being uh, supplanted right. by a denial of service, distributed denial of service attack? new things are popping up in the same way that new illnesses are popping up. Yeah. So I think we have to take a, a little bit longer, a little bit broader view of what it means to be more secure or more healthy. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point, Chuck. I think, uh, you know, uh, one, one thing to our advantage in healthcare is our bodies are, you know, we're not changing that much physiologically. We still have the same organs and same physiology. Uh, whereas in you know our sort of uh, cyber uh, infrastructure is like growing like crazy and and yeah. yeah. So there's been a couple of comparisons to um, risk analysis with health industry. Mm -hmm. um, it strikes me as long as we're looking at adversarial, um, there should be a wealth of data looking at risk analysis with respect to the military, um, where you have you know, new threats that come up where you have to plan for unexpected threats. And um, I'm wondering, will analysis techniques from that sort of area with, you know, will yeah. the way you target what sort of data you should get in order to be able to prepare yourself, is that something to look at? Yeah. Um, I, I have um, an opinion on that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I always have an opinion. But, uh, you know, that's a good example. Uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a meeting listening to uh, Air Force uh, General talking about some Air Force uh, developments and what their you know technology has been doing, and he, and he said, uh, you know, in two or three years, we're really going to be prepared to fight a war in Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I think the bigger question there is, you know, you look at uh, traditional military uh, history, and. And it seems to me we've got like 3,000 years of recorded, you know, military conflict going back to the Greeks and before. And it seems like every time we go into a conflict that we're surprised, right? So, so even though we have this sort of all this uh, uh, experience and preparation, uh, there's some tactic or some aspect of the uh, conflict surprises us and we're not prepared. And in cyber warfare, you know, notwithstanding, I, I'm not sure to count whether you count Georgia and, and Estonia as, as real cyber conflicts, but uh, I don't think we've seen that yet. So to think that we can predict something in a domain where we really have no experience uh, any better than we're going to be able to do in, in the kinetic world, uh, I think is unreasonable. So we're going to be surprised. I think we should be prepared to be very surprised. Yeah. Is this perhaps an, an artifact of the fact that it is an adversarial environment that this is just going to right. happen and we yeah. have to live with it? That's right. That's right. That's one big difference, too, between healthcare. I mean, nature evolves and viruses evolve, but maybe on a different time scale uh, than uh, virus uh, developers. I'm yeah, a it's a bad uh, pun there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I've just mm -hmm. been given the assignment of, of being the hook to end yeah. this. So let's take one more question. Just, just one more. Um, you know, in um, uh, in steganography and covert communication, and also in selected areas in, in forensics, we've noticed the state of the art is sort of a cat and mouse game. I can detect you. You can evade my detector. Right. I amend my detector. And um, uh, I've noticed this is very similar to the state of cryptography in the early 20th century. And between then and now, there were dramatic uh, shifts in the landscape, uh, scientific discoveries that caused the cryptography problem to converge 
We don't know if that's going to happen in uh, these other areas. We don't know if there's going to be a Horst Feistel of steganography, if there's going to be a Claude Shannon of steganography. Uh, and so uh, isn't that a challenge for making predictions about where, how secure things are going to be 20 years in the future? Because uh, that would require us to second guess um, these sort of scientific shifts. Yeah. Um, so I think most, sci I'm going to make a statement here, most cybersecurity problems uh, occur because people make mistakes. And even in a crypto system, uh, if you don't uh, implement it properly or there's a problem in the compiler or something or in the device that it's running on, you know, that could be an issue. So people make mistakes. I don't see that changing. You know, I, you know, I think that's going to, people are still going to make mistakes and they're still going to be. So you might reduce a big part of the attack surface, but we're going to be dealing with this for a long time as far as I know. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, George. Let's thank George. <clears throat>